Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Professor Hull, and we are going to be talking about Save Me the Waltz by Zelda Fitzgerald. This is the second of two lectures um, on Zelda Fitzgerald and her novel. And um, if you have not watched the first one, I highly recommend you do that because the book is partially um, autobiographical in nature, although it is a, a fictionalized work. Um, so... I recommend that you learn about her biography before you learn about the book based on her life. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the right writing and publication history um, and Tender is the Night as kind of a footnote. I really would like to talk about Zelda Fitzgerald without talking about her husband, F. Scott Fitzgerald, but it's kind of impossible because their lives are really so intertwined and so is their work. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald took inspiration from his wife as uh, a number in a number of his short stories and books, um, particularly his book Tender is the Night, which he was working on at the same time that she wrote this book, Save Me the Waltz. Um, so basically, that is putting it mildly because what scholars have discovered through their diaries and letters and, and other uh, information, looking at drafts and things like that, is that he took some pieces of his books directly from her diary entries um, in, in a way kind of plagiarizing her personal writings and, and using them um, to further his own career, which benefited the both of them. But um, what happens with this book is that, as I mentioned in, in the previous lecture, she is in Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore at the time that she wrote this. She begins writing it as part of her therapy and then kind of be, gets obsessed with it and writes it in kind of a frenzy. And um, when her husband saw the book, he was not happy. <laughs> Now, there's some debate as to how much influence he had with editing the book. There are some scholars who say that he made her cut large pieces of the book out because um, she used a lot of the same events of their life and marriage together that he used for Tenderest Night. And he knew that uh, his book was uh, going to be published um, fairly soon. He was still working on it at the time that she finished her book, which is probably why she worked on it so quickly, if you ask me. But um, so some people claim that he made her cut large pieces of it. And that because of that, the narrative that she presents seems a bit disjointed. Um, I don't, I don't know, because when you look at the drafts, um, he has a few changes, but nothing substantial. And it seems more like she's doing, she's the one doing the editing. Having said that, um, we don't really know what the conversations were between them that may have led her to edit more. And we certainly don't have every single draft that she um, that she produced during this time. So it's possible that um, that he saw things that he did cut out or asked her to cut out. And one of those things is that his his character based on Zelda and Tender as the Night I mentioned this in, in, also in the previous video. Um, character there who is struggling with mental illness and eventually it comes out that her father abused her. That is nowhere in this book. And so it's not clear if that is something that um, was in this book that she cut out, um, was never in this book, uh, happened, but she didn't want to talk about, never happened and he just made up, or never happened and kind of, again, might be symbolic of the crumbling South during this time because we are at this point into uh, the, the Great Depression and, and past the so-called Roaring Twenties. So essentially, uh, that's a little bit of the controversy or, or the backstory of the writing of this book. The way that it was published... She sent the book to his publisher. Um, he owed a debt to the publisher. Um, 
And she basically sent it to him saying, you know, I know that Scott is working on some of this on his own um, and may have a different story for you. I don't know whether or not this book is any good, but it might be. And I, I think it has some merit. So the publisher takes it and basically uh, says, we will publish this in order to pay off your husband's debt. That's how it ended up being published. They had a run of 3,000 books, only about 1,200 sold, because again, by that time, um, the two of them were essentially separated. He was still famous, but she was not as much, and she was known for being in and out of mental institutions and having some problems. And so her celebrity had kind of worn thin. There are also mixed reviews on this book. And I do think it has literary merit. Is it the best book I ever read my whole life? It sure isn't. <laughs> Is it my favorite book? No. But I do think that it's good. And I do think it's worthy of study. Otherwise, I would not have assigned it for this class or be talking about it. Um, so the reviews are mixed. And in part, you know, the relationship is so complicated between them um, as a husband and wife really is toxic. And you can see this on again, off again um, thing play out. If you've seen that happen in real life, it's never good. Right. Um, so basically, he calls her a third rate writer. And she says, um, please don't discourage me for I'm discouraged enough already and um, basically begs him to be kinder to her um, in in a way. So um, sometimes he's supportive of her and sometimes not so much. Um, yeah. So an overview of the book. The book is divided into four sections. Um, four periods of Alabama's life. That's the main character. Alabama Biggs and her husband, David Knight. Um, David is when, when Alabama meets him, he is a, uh, kind of nobody in a way, which is interesting given how he treats her. Alabama is like Zelda herself, a, a flapper and a socialite and uh, a girl who has just a spark and a love for life and a real energy about her and is just dating a number of different boys <laughs> kind of running around town uh, to much to the chagrin of her father while her mother is kind of like, well, just let her be. That's just how she is. Um, and kind of uh, like that, uh, very indulgent of her. Um, it's the jazz age and they get married and then um, their marriage deteriorates. Alabama grows apart from her husband, who's an alcoholic. Um, she has a daughter, but she's not really connected to her daughter either. And um, after her husband has an affair with a dancer, she decides to uh, herself become a dancer and aspires to become a prima ballerina just like Zelda herself, um, and devote herself to this, this ambition. We're going to talk about the end at the end of this lecture. And that way, if anybody doesn't want spoilers, they can turn it off. So that's basically the book. Is it experimental? You know, a lot of the Lost Generation writers are interested in, in experimenting with writing. And one of the things that she does is mix, um, biographical details with fiction in kind of this unique way. And so I'd like you to watch for that. There are some things that are very uh, true to her life and almost like a biography. And there are other things that she's completely making up, right? So did her husband have an affair with a dancer? And is that what inspired her to become a dancer? Maybe, <laughs> um, but certainly a lot of the other characters that are in the book are, are completely um, fictionalized and uh, especially the way that she's telling the story, um, the style of the story is quite unique. So one of the things that I think gets overlooked with this book a lot is just how masterfully she does um, adapt her style to the structure of the story. So in the beginning part, 
of the book where she is um, young and kind of flighty, we have um, little bits, little bits and babs and and bobs, uh, again, a little bit more experimental. It is told in a linear way, chronologically, but um, we have little scenes of this happened with her sister, and then she said this to her mother, and then uh, the next thing you know, she herself is grown up, and then she's going off here and there. And um, then... Once she meets David, and especially when they travel uh, to to various locations throughout the book, um, her style becomes much more, I would say, evocative. So it, in many places in the first chapters, but especially in the middle, um, we have a ton of similes, metaphors. Um, I'm going to read you just a, a bit here. Um, Here's chapter two. They hung above the city like an indigo wash, forming themselves from asphalt dust and sooty shadows under the cornices and limp gusts of air exhaled from the closing windows. They lay above the streets like a white fog off a swamp. Through the gloom, the whole world went to tea. Girls in short amorphous capes and long flowing skirts and hats like straw bathtubs waited for taxis in front of the Plaza Grill. Girls in long satin coats and colored shoes and hats like straw manhole covers tapped the tune of a cataract on the dance floor of the Lorraine and the St. Regis. Under the somber, ironic parrots of the Biltmore, a halo of golden bobs disintegrated into black lace and shoulder bouquets between the pale hours of tea and dinner that sealed the princely windows. The clank of lank contemporaneous silhouettes drowned the clatter of teacups at the Ritz. So um, in that chapter, I did a search. And in that chapter, she uses the word like 154 times. Almost all of those times, it's a comparison. But you get this image, indigo, like ash asphalt and dust and soot and then all of a sudden um through the fog everybody's going to tea now that it's it's afternoon and we have girls in these huge (laughs) straws and capes and long flowing skirts and then those change into long satin coats and dresses as we go from tea into uh the the dance floor right and all of these people with their little bobbed haircuts now because it's the 20s and it's just we've all cut our hair and we can let loose and just dance the night away um it's so beautifully written but interestingly not just that the style is so beautiful um but that it changes so that by the end of the book when we're back we've gone to to new york and france and italy and then we're back in alabama Now um, we've moved through the book from the 1920s into the 1930s. It's the Depression and the style changes. It's much more somber. Um, It's much less poetic and um, much um, much more sparse, I would say. So that's something that I'd really like you to look for. How do we have... Um, kind of fragmented incidents in the beginning of the book as, as we kind of have these, like like how childhood memories work, right? And then the, st- the style, um, these beautiful images throughout, and, and then how they kind of also kind of disintegrate as we, um, as we come back to the end and as we have Alabama being like many of the last generation, alienated and and more cynical, um, feeling somber about uh, what's going on at the end of the book. So point of view, 
Um, psychological subjectivity is something that a lot of the last generation writers are known for. And to have that come across, I think it's very interesting because Zelda does not choose to have this book be written in first person. She doesn't tell it from the point of view of Alabama herself. Instead, we have a third person narrator um, who is... What, what's called limited third person. So limited third person is told from an outside perspective. So it's not, I did this, I did that. We went here and there, right? As you heard in the thing, they felt, they saw, um, she went, that kind of thing. Um, but it's limited in that really it's just following Alabama around. And because of this point of view, we are able to see a little bit of um, her psychological makeup and how she she feels about things. The real turning point of um, the book hangs mostly on characterization, which I'll get to in a minute. So in terms of plot, we don't have a plot-driven novel. We have a character-driven novel that is all about how this particular girl feels um, from her childhood with parents who are kind of devaluing her intelligence and um, in a town where really everybody's kind of talking about her looks and um, and her her money and that kind of thing. And then moving into her marriage that is ultimately unfulfilling. And then through a series of things where she's trying to kind of find herself and her identity through dance and through this creative outlet, right? So that's the point of view. It's going to be really following her and how she feels about things. So I'd like you to watch for that as well. What do we not know? Um, because it's subjective, meaning that it's almost from her point of view. What do we not know about the other characters? Because many of the other characters, including David to a certain extent, Alabama's husband, um, are quite thin. And that is something that is criticized about this book uh, often. I don't know. Um, one of two things. Either it's deliberate because uh, the author wants you to just focus on Alabama herself, uh, a girl who, as her husband becomes a famous painter, is often overlooked um, and as she becomes a woman is, is often uh, kind of ignored. Or if Zelda herself was kind of um, a little bit self-centered and focused on herself and her marriage to Scott and not a whole lot of anything else. Um, I don't know. One of the two. It's up to you to decide. So the characterization, it is told in limited third person. Um, the, the feminist themes are here of forging one's identity. And we'll talk about, you know, you can see the list of themes over over there. Um, but her father is emotionally distant. Her mother is indulgent. In the first chapter, she says, um, Mama, I don't want to go to school anymore. I seem to know everything. And her mother quickly informs her that she knows nothing and to shut up about it, basically. And uh, later on, uh, she's she's told, don't worry your pretty little head about things like that till you have to. She's concerned about her sister, uh, who's also having a tumultuous courtship. Um, her older sister sees, uh, it has this man who is pouring his personality into the mold of her society, um, which is... Uh, it's such a good turn of phrase. So Alabama is this spunky, bright girl, and they're not um, they're not valuing her for that. And you can see the frustration even as a child. And then she begins to kind of act out by going to these dances, by running around with boys, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really because uh, she's kind of bored and looking for herself. She barrels her way through life, not really caring about what anybody in town thinks of her. And when she meets David, he carves his name and her name into a tree and he writes David David night 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 and Miss Alabama nobody so you can see right from the get-go um the relationship between these two whether or not it it 
kind of mirrored Zelda's relationship with Scott, it's subjective. It's her point of view, right? It's her telling the story. He gets his own chance to tell the story in a different book. And we'll talk about that later. But in this book, David who actually is a nobody, by the way, in this scene. He has no money. He has no prospects. It's that he has this vague idea that maybe he'll be an artist someday um, and that he's going to make it big. Um, Writes his name three times and says that she's a nobody. Little Miss Alabama nobody. And in fact, she is the one who has a, a family name, money, wealth, status, position, all of that kind of thing. So it is uh, gaslighting. He's gaslighting her in that scene. But that point, I think, um, is quite important in the book because it sets up their entire relationship. Um, It sets up how he looks at her, how she looks at him. And then the turning point of the book kind of comes when she tries to reclaim her identity by being a dancer. Um... She is still doing this because she thinks that he has slept with a dancer who's this very charismatic ballerina. Um, So her kind of, her artistic aspirations are still being driven by a man and being driven by jealousy. Um, And I think in part because of that, they are doomed to fail but um yeah the characterization and the point of view are really intimately tied and i really want you guys to look at that the settings are important um being in alabama and then um being abroad as expatriates in france and then later in italy how she tries to find herself in each one of those three places that's what i'd like you to look at um we have alabama france italy and then back to alabama Uh, The state, not the person. (laughs) Um, So at the end, we return to Alabama. And um, I don't want to get into the end quite yet. But also, again, as I said, the structure is tied into the settings. How are are each of those places described um, is something I would like you to watch for. So themes, feminism, individualism, and the quest for self kind of all go together. Um, As I said, this woman is trying to find herself, trying to discover herself, who she is outside of these traditional female roles that she's been placed into by her parents and also later by her husband. Um, And I do feel bad for her child because the child in this book gets kind of ignored, as I suspect the child did in real life, uh, Scotty. We have this idea of art and creative output. So again, like Zelda's real life, she's searching for a a way to have this creative output to to show not just her talent, but her mind, her ideas, her psyche um, on the page, through dance, uh, in paint, um, all of these different things. So here, um, David is the painter has the creative outlet. He is producing things, especially as a man. He's putting forth work into the world and and being very celebrated for it and uh, and finding financial success as well. Um, and she is um, struggling to find her herself and her place. And, and especially because they have such a rocky marriage, she's not going to find her place in that. So cynicism, you're going to see Alabama go from, it's a coming of age story in a way. And she's going from being this very wide, bright eyed little girl who's full of sparkle um, to really kind of being broken down by life. And putting herself into these new modern values of doing things differently and playing by your own rules. And it's all about materialism and hedonism and living in the moment and just going off to Europe and going wherever the wind may take you. And then trying to um, find discipline through dance later on Um, and finding out that the modern values and, and this hedonistic lifestyle is really not all it's cracked up to be. It feels very hollow and empty in the end. And those are things that you can find in any 
Lost Generation book. And that's why I think that this one in particular is an important one to read because um, you're seeing those things really from a uniquely feminine perspective and um, particularly how women felt about it. Watching also their husbands indulge in alcohol and become addicted to substances and and not being able to do anything about that and seeing their husbands have affairs and then they're having affairs kind of at the same time. Um, uh, yeah, so all of those, I, I think, it's kind of connect together, right? Um, and if you don't want spoilers about the end, this is where you turn off the video. And I'll give you a moment to do that if you want. Okay. Um, I don't always talk about the ending of books when I do these lectures because I want you to read them <laughs> and I don't want to give things away. And I don't, if you're not in my class, I don't want to do your homework for you. Um, I'd rather tell you kind of what to look for and what to think about while you're reading than give you like actual answers. But here's the thing. Um, this ending is fascinating to me. The ending of this book because what happens in the end, without giving away all the details, is that Alabama has been dancing. Um, she gets, uh, I won't get into, again, gross details, but if, essentially she gets a, a career-ending injury um, from uh, in her foot that basically she, she can't recover from. And then at the same time, her father is dying. And so she and David return back to Alabama. Now we're in Alabama in the 1930s as the South is kind of struggling through the um, the Great Depression. Never really recovered from the Civil War. And just as they were sort of recovering, the Great Depression hits. And all the problems that I talk about in my video about uh, the history of this time period, um, the Dust Bowl, the problems with agriculture, major drought at this point in time, and, and all of that hit the South very hard. Um, and in many ways, I think even now, 100 years later, we can see in certain pockets, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, some other places, some, some people who... Is, sorry. People who live in certain areas where really economically it never fully recovered. So basically, as my computer is about to shut down, um, basically, in the end, she she does not become a successful ballerina. And I think that that particular point is interesting because this is a fictionalized version of Zelda herself, very clearly. And it's almost like... Just as her career is beginning to flourish, Alabama takes an opportunity that Zelda did not. Zelda had an opportunity to actually dance with a company, and because of her family and her mental health issues, she chose not to do it. And Alabama uh, takes the opportunity and then has this injury. And it, to me, it's almost like even in fiction, Zelda can't picture a better set of circumstances for herself. And she ends it in this very cynical, sad kind of way. And again, it's very in keeping with the lost generation. Um, and so I think a, a lesser writer would have written a happier ending. Um, and, and that's one of the things I want you to think about. Uh, the ending, how this fits in with the lost generation, how the themes connect, and especially the female perspective. Because um, I think we're going to see a lot of the same kind of themes from the men that we're reading um, and from the other books and, and the poets, too. We have a few women poets, but to me, this book is really unique in that way. So I hope you enjoy it. That's it. Thanks, everybody.